Okay, so yeah, our um, thing is also a bit different than usual. Um, <laughs> we didn't prepare an actual presentation, um, but we just wanted to make some uh, uh, interaction go, get some interaction going with you guys um, to figure out um, about the adoption of Kubernetes and kind of uh, what kind of normal questions that come up, and maybe we can answer some or even. Uh, just have some talk, talk talk about some things that our customers uh, ask us all the time. So yeah, um, I think we should just get started with some questions to the audience. Um, we have a few prepared, so if you could just answer in the chat, that would be great. So uh, first one, uh, who is already using Kubernetes right now? Uh, it's got a few. OpenShift, yeah, can't. Uh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, that would be my next question. Basically, who is planning on using Kubernetes in the near future? I guess Yotic is. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so, who is using a Ah, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> the, rest, the Raspberry Pi cluster, yeah, it's a good way to get started, I guess. <laughs> um, so who is using a, a managed Kubernetes out there? Or or maybe phrase it like, is there someone not using a, Kubernetes, a managed Kubernetes? That would be interesting. Like answer with not managed if you if you are. Yeah. Using your self-hosted, self-maintained Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> well managed by another team. Okay, yeah, still. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um Minikube. Yeah, of course, Minikube. <laughs> Okay, I guess that's it for the questions yeah. to the audience right now. There are some Kate's users there, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so are there any questions from the audience, actually? Is there anything you would... I mean, we, we are actually working with GKE on a database, right? Um, trying to, to put some, some applications in which we can actually yeah, manage or which we manage for customers and trying to um, automate stuff where possible. I don't know, are there any questions from the audience? We just put them into the chat. If not, I'd say we start with some prepared ones, right? Oh. Service elastic. Well, best practice on making service elastic. I'd say to make it really elastic first, your deployment or whatever really depends on good request set, right? Otherwise, it's hard to, to auto-scale there. Um, what we basically do, yeah, we're just using normal HPA, so horizontal pod autoscalers, for um, for automatic scaling on a separate node pool, actually. That's cool if you, you're on GCP or generally the cloud, you can just uh, like like uh, divide your workloads or, yeah, just put them on different um, Kubernetes um, node pools and then basically have that scaled. Um, yeah, experience with preempt uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of the first question still. Um, what we actually also struggle with is uh, vertical auto scaling. Right, Cyril? Mm, um, yeah. <laughs> that's not really cool. If you have actually workflows where which are using like most of the time just let's say 100 millicores, 200 millicores, and 500 megram, and then they basically, yeah, they, they go up a lot then you would like to have dynamic limits or something like that. And that's something which is which is still missing. Or if you if you use the, the, the vertical autoscaling project, then there will be pod restarts, which is mm -hmm. also something you actually don't really want. So I think horizontal autoscaling is actually working quite well, I'd say, so far. Yeah, I think, I think I think it really depends if you have stateless pods. If you have stateless pods, it's easy. Easy, yeah. There's yeah. not that much, yeah, that, that's pretty easy. But if you have stateful workloads, then yeah, then you run into those uh, 
vertical scaling issues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the next one, experience with preemptive remote with GKE. Yes, we actually have experience. <laughs> to be honest, we think it got worse in the last couple of weeks. We're actually mm -hmm. using preemptible nodes for our tests. So um, as Jacob already mentioned, we're using, uh, we're actually building Terraform modules, which then deploy stuff to Kubernetes and to the outer infrastructure. And every module is tested with Go code, basically. We're using, um, or we're actually using TerraTest from Gruntberg to, um, to accomplish that. And for those short tests, we use preemptible nodes, like we're using uh, temporary clusters in those tests with preemptible nodes. And if you have a longer running test, then we have very, very flaky tests. Tests, tests, sorry. That's what I can actually say out of my own yeah. experience. And we started, um, we wanted to use preemptible nodes for our GitLab runner jobs, yeah. because it's like the perfect use case. You, some job starts and node scales up, goes away again, it doesn't matter. But what we uh, noticed at the beginning of April, I think, we noticed that uh, nodes were preempted all the time. So basically, uh, Google also writes in their documentation that after one min minute or in the first few minutes of a node lifespan, it can be preempted, preempted uh, more quickly. That means new nodes uh, get killed first. And when you have jobs, then your jobs fail all the time. So yeah, we stopped using preemptible there. What is, that underneath, what is the underneath virtualization system which you use? Um, so you yeah, the virtual, yeah, that's that's uh, Google's uh, just Google's virtualization. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's just Google Compute Nodes. Yeah. yeah. There's also been a, like a, a bug with the GitLab runners, right? That they were not really working well in conjunction with preemptible nodes, and especially with auto scaling. Mm. There actually there was uh, a long running bug, and then I think uh, GitLab now, yeah, sir, uh, solved it by by changing their whole approach how they get log outputs from from pods from their workflow pods. I think is that right? They now use Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they, they yeah, but, now, basically. but it's still in a preview phase. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. But for us, it actually works, right? Yeah, mostly. So yeah, preemptible nodes for, uh, I mean, it, it worked for us for quite some time, but recently I think, yeah. I at least in my, in the, in the, the Terraform modules I developed last week, um, I changed to Sono clusters with normal normal nodes, basically, not preemptible ones. Yeah, any other questions? One of the prepared questions, basically, one of the questions uh, we actually um, got asked, um, is or what we actually noticed is that when we when we deliver clusters to, to customers, right, uh, we noticed that most of them actually don't know how to get resources up. They're, like people always try to 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 or they ask, well, what's the best way now? What's the best way now? I want to deploy my app because that's what most people have. They have a container and maybe they already have a Helm chart or customized stuff. Um, so so how do I get it on? And also in the you questions actually. Many people say we have own custom bash scripts, which they either apply manually or run manually, and then um, or they, they actually put them into their CI/CD system. And we don't think that's such a good practice. We actually we we, we like GitOps. Uh, we already have a presentation about Oracle CD because that's what we uh, we are also uh, using for for some applications for online applications. But in the end, actually, we just we just would propose that GitOps is a, a better way to actually get resources onto your Kubernetes cluster. If you have them in Git, you can see a history, right? And you have some controller which takes those resources uh, out of Git's, Git, like the definitions, and applies it or applies them to the cluster. What do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by delivering clusters to, to customers? Is this like kind of some hybrid setup that you run on prem? Uh, no, what? What we basically we have that product nine manage GK. So we there's a GK cluster we take and we deploy applications on it. Just uh, to get those okay. applications which are managed by us, like all the stuff we actually additionally need, like the voice, We also use uh, or 
and deploy Loki for, for a logging solution. Um, we put a lot of uh, OAuth proxies in front to have single sign on. So we basically mm -hmm. provide a, 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 an ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what I mean with when we deliver clusters to customers because they just order them. Um, and then basically, yeah, they get it and then they try to get uh, applications on the cluster. Yeah, and I just want to say, like, try to use GitOps, uh, like Flux, Flux is, 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 is cool, Argo CD is cool, or, um, I don't know, or basically, I don't know if there are any other big tools out, out there, but use something like the controller, which applies stuff if, if you have Git and don't use Kube control, apply. I mean, for one shots, that's totally fine, but, but for, for stuff where you actually need to deploy regularly, uh, we think that's not a so good way. Right, sir? Do you have anything to add? Or? Yeah, no. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> Any questions came up so far? Nothing in the chat, so I guess not. Uh, yeah, do you want to ask me another question? Like, how do you back up your cube? Oh, sorry. There's actually a question. There is. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, well, I'd say scrolling months, helps. Even. <laughs> scrolling, <laughs> scrolling helps. Um, to get started with GCP, a few of my services. So simple. Oh, any nice tutorial? Tutorial here for you. Oh, I posted a link for that. In, in case, uh, oh, you already did. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I think we're lacking behind you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> at, at least I do. Um, yeah. What about vertical scaling nodes? For you mean for for dynamic workloads? Uh, is that is that such a feature? I, I don't think so, Be because you you have a node pool defined with a fixed node size. Node so, type, yeah. Yeah, node type. So yeah. But, but technically, you you can do it. So you can uh, on a on a GKE cluster or Kubernetes. There's the vertical auto scaler and the yeah, but, but that, that, that the vertical auto scaler doesn't change your your node. It actually change mm -hmm. the requests or limits on your deployments. Okay. okay. That's that's what it does. And the, the problem about it is, and I think that's just Kubernetes related, so it has actually nothing to do with GK. Um, it, it restarts your pods. If you have something, let's say Prometheus, for example, Prometheus does a compaction every two hours where it needs more CPU and uh, also more memory. And if that actually, yeah, if that would hit or would be hit by the vertical autoscaler, um, then it would restart your Prometheus pod. And then it restarts, and then it needs to replay the, the write ahead write ahead block, right? And that also takes more resources, so that's, that's bad. <laughs> um, that's why I guess for, for, for Prometheus, that wouldn't be a, a good use case there. Yeah, preemptible nodes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, preemptible nice nodes point. are the, the, the equivalent of spot instances on AWS, just yeah. you might be more familiar with them. Uh, do you work with custom resource definitions? Yes, we do. I mean, uh, like for example, Cert Manager, uh, which we deploy uses CRDs. Um, uh, for an upcoming thing, uh, Prometheus Operator also uses CRDs, for example. And uh, what, what we started with when we actually tested our modules, we had a single testing cluster. And when you work with CRDs, that's actually an issue. Because you always need to go after it, test into a clean state, like to delete that CRD. Um, you have to always have a, a like a predefined state, and that's also like CRDs are also a reason why we actually move to temporary GK clusters in our tests. I think. Yeah, well, the the thing with CRDs is just that they're cluster wide, so you can only install them once and only one version, basically. Well, it depends if the API version actually changes, you can have multiple ones. But yeah. CRD management is still, I think, something that is really hard <laughs> in Kubernetes in general. Yeah, especially updating as well, right? Yeah. We, for example, we updated Cert Manager today. Um, yeah, and in the end, I mean, um, is Rama actually in the chat? I think he is. <laughs> yeah, and, and in the end, we, we, we didn't go away with updating from version to version to version. Because it, it actually was just easier to replace the CRDs. With server should actually that worked. And there were no um, like issues for customers or whatever. But there might be other um, other
other software where you actually yeah, where you run into issues. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, for example, Prometheus operator, they 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 um, they released a new version zero point three nine recently, where they actually went to a new what is it CRD API definition right or definition API I think version which is ever labeled since Kubernetes one point sixteen. But I think it was the first really breaking breaking change in Prometheus operator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people who have actually nodes lower than one point sixteen can Using the version files. Yeah, that's also something. Not using stack driver for logging. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> the thing is, when we when, when we built that whole product, um, nine managed GKE, we, we actually wanted to provide something which is still where the data is still in Switzerland. And for logging, actually, Google does not guarantee that those logs will stay in the region. That's why we said, that was one of the reasons why we said, okay, we, we, we deploy something ourselves. Um, there's also like, there's also, I think an upcoming feature where you can actually um, integrate Loki alerts. Like you, you alert on specific lines, like lines with errors or whatever rec regex you can come up with. And that's also something which is, which is actually really cool. So we yeah. set up, we set up Loki. Yeah, and also we're, we're just big fans of Grafana in general, so. Yeah. Uh, we just deploy Grafana instance, uh, customers can create their dashboards and you can have side by side your uh, graphs and logs. It's, I think it's really nice. I mean, Stackdriver probably could do some of that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's also, what, what we actually aim for is that you define your, your infrastructure in your Kubernetes cluster. I mean, to be honest, that's not the case yet, but that's something where we are aiming for. For example, that you define your alerting rules with Prometheus operator in CRDs and um, have it have it coupled to your application, which you also define define by don't deploy by GitHub, right? So that's something you don't need to click. We we actually don't like to click. Uh, we we try to have all the stuff in GitHub. Uh, Cyril, experience with persistent volumes and backup. You're the Valero master. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, we use uh, Valero, it's an open source project for backups. Um, we've had really good experience with it. Um, the, the thing is, it depends on, the, the persistent web volume backup depends on the cloud provider. So, for example, if you use GKE, you have uh, normal persistent volumes, uh, persistent disks, then it's easy to back them up because you can just take a snapshot. And uh, the tool Valero will actually detect your PVCs and do the snapshot in the background via the GCP API. <coughs> Same goes for AWS, for example. So if you have that, that's really nice. Um, if you have some custom solution, um, like let's say Ceph storage, um, then Valero actually offers um, to back Back the PV up with um, with uh, Restic, it's called. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I I haven't used that yet, and I don't know how well it works, especially for I think for PVs which are only read write once, it won't work because you cannot. Uh, Valero has no way to access the data. <clears throat> it's terrible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, in general. If you're on a cloud provider, it's easy with just use the built-in snapshot feature. Use a tool like Valero. Yeah. You might actually have good experience with it. It also backups your whole cluster, like all the resources, and can put them into a bucket. Yeah. So it's a uh, yeah, it's a, no, a, a tool for in general for, for backup. Yeah, I can put in the link. Yeah. Um, any good hit or experience in config pod eviction policies? Actually, I, I don't. I don't. Eviction policies, I mean, yeah, we tackled it once, I think, just in, just in a meeting. Um, but we, I think we didn't go so, so far yet. Mm. I mean, we have, we, have to, we, have to, we have to fight uh, like many, many places. I mean, our, our team is not big. And yeah, no, 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 we did not really tackle that yet, let's say. What I would actually like to, to know from the audience is, is anyone having own um, webhooks, so validating or mutating webhooks? Is anyone using that? No. I'd say no. 
<laughs> probably not. <laughs> probably, probably not, because we are we, we wrote some custom software which is which is making use of that. But okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So another question, yeah, which we also like: how to create and use infrastructure around Kubernetes in the cloud. Uh, I think I already I already um, wrote a bit about it. So far, um, if the customer needs additional infrastructure at Google, like GCS buckets or databases or whatever, they basically come to us and tell us what they need, and we will uh, spawn it for them. We do it all via Terraform, it was already set. But in the end, we actually want that the customer can provision that itself via Kubernetes. Um, we have some we have some ideas, basically how to but, how to achieve that. Yeah, but I guess you don't run databases in Kubernetes itself. No, no, but that's that's one of our principles. I'd say whenever there is a service, a managed service at Google, we try to use it. Mm. As I, as, I, as I said, I mean we're we're a small team, and the more software you actually manage, the more people you. you we we also noticed, for example, uh, Roman said it today. We, we we do a lot of maintenance just recently. Updating versions, Nginx Ingress new version, and a certain engine new version, and whatever. And that's why we said, yeah, let's go to, uh, let's use most or like managed services from Google. And uh, yeah, but but in the end, it would be cool if, if the customer could spawn that in in the cluster. It's something that we are also working on, self service basically. Yeah, and um, there's there's a different number of projects out there already that. Um, Help you do that. You can set it up yourself. Uh, for example, Crossplane, or Google even has their Config Connector, mm -hmm. which um, maps to every resource, basically almost every resource of Google. But yeah, there's some drawbacks here and there. But I think if you just <clears throat> if you have a single or two clusters, yeah, that would be fine. Mm. So yeah, but for in general, we are using Terraform. Um, we actually build, or we, we're using GitLab as well, having pipelines which apply fully automatically our Terraform modules, which we configure uh, per customer, per customer repo, actually. We have one repository per customer. Anything to add here, sir? You're the master of that? Just no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Another thing was what, how should we monitor in? Kubernetes. Um, yeah, what you should monitor. I mean, if you if, if you have your own cluster, if you manage your own cluster, which apparently no one does, right? We got no answer in the chat. Um, then you have then you have different issues, right? Because then you need to, to, to monitor the API and latency and, and whatever. Monitor etcd and whatever. But if you use a managed solution, or if you actually just use yeah, if you just want to provide your application, I think. Um, you should at least monitor the pod restart. That's that's also that's what something we also do. That's a, a very very minimum. So if your pod often restarts, it looks like you have an issue either with limits or your application fails or your liveness uh, probe is not really the best. Um, um, and also, what is very good I'd say is response codes of HTTP responses. So if there let's say are seventy or eighty percent of your whole Responses are 500, and you also might have an issue, right? And there's actually the Kubernetes Nixons project, um, which provides some alerts for Prometheus. So yeah, actually use Prometheus because that's the de facto standard, and I think you will get most of the most you will most find uh, resources on the internet about it. And uh, yeah, and what we also do, what we also um, think is best, is always monitor. Out of your customer's view. So if you have an app and you, and you run it in, in, in Kubernetes, I don't know. Don't don't monitor whatever aspect, but try to monitor what your customer experiences. It's also the 500, right? The, the customer should never see a 500. Actually, that would be perfect world. <laughs> and we yeah we we actually use we, we monitor error rates, latencies. Uh, what else do we monitor? I think yeah. Does this mean you monitor also? We do as well. As well. Actually. 
we, we, we monitor from the inside of the customer's cluster and also for some stuff from the outside, actually. Because mm -hmm. we, we, we have our clusters as well. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, yeah and in the, end, in the end, if you just monitor from inside the cluster and your whole cluster is yeah. down, you probably won't get an alert. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's you need to have something at least to check if the monitoring system is up. And there's also, I mean, we are also using that that man snitch alert, that man switch, like I always say. That's, yeah. <laughs> that man switch alert, which basically shows if your whole notification chain is still working. That's that's basically an alert, which is always fired by Chrome Decoys. And, uh, but you need a notification system which actually supports it. So if, if that alert doesn't come up anymore, you should actually be notified. So it's, it's more of the reverse case, right? But that's also mm. something we, we use. We're using PagerDuty for um, alerting and also yeah, Slack, right? Uh, and PagerDuty actually supports that. Yeah. Uh, Victor, uh, uh, Victor asked cost. Cost of what? <laughs> Hi, maybe I just think it. it's just easier. I was just wondering yeah. whether you guys also provide some kind of cost driven approach to the customers or they are just paying to. Google and that's it. Because right. Yeah. Like my experience is that when you try to sell or tell someone, yeah, let's have a Kubernetes cluster, and then it's expensive because of what is offering and so on. People do not really understand where these are coming from. So that's maybe just a more high-level question. That's it. I'm actually not sure if I, if I understood. Well, well, the 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 costs um, of the the Google costs are directly built to the customer. And yeah. then there's just an additional fee on top for our managed stuff, basically. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah. pretty yeah. simple. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but yeah, it's not cheap. I mean, go, I mean, Kubernetes clusters in general are not cheap. Yeah. Um, how do you make sure that the load is equally distributed between the zones? Um, well, one, one uh, uh, way would be to use pod anti affinities. So, um, an anti-affinity, you can set a, a key, and the key in this case could be a, a compute zone or even a node name. And then Kubernetes will make sure that uh, if you have a deployment of three pods, only one pod uh, will be spawned per node. So that's pretty nice to distribute load between zones. Yeah. Anything to add, Nick? Mm. Not really. I mean, I mean, sometimes you actually can't really do that. If you have, if you have, if you have stuff which actually just runs in one process, which you can't horizontally scale, then it's yeah, hard to, course. to basically, yeah, to to spread the load there. But for for other stuff, we're using pod anti affinities. We are also using change tolerations. Um, our whole model actually is is a bit special because um, what we do if when we provide a cluster to the customer. There's always a, a node pool for, for us where we run the managed software, and there's a node pool for the customer. But actually, I'd say it's transparent to the customer, so whenever the customer spawns something, um, it will land on the customer nodes, and our stuff always lands on our nodes. That's, that's actually also done for that we are not interfering. If there's something, mm -hmm. basically, if we do an error, if, if, if some software uh, uses way more memory, we don't want to affect the customer, actually. That's why we uh, in uh, let's, let's we came up with that split. We developed some software which does that automatically. Uh, yeah, that's one of our approaches there. And yeah, we are actually only using regional clusters. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think in general, um, I I wouldn't see that why you would use several clusters. Um, or I mean, it's not. Yeah, for testing and, and development maybe, but anything other than that, it's 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 not actually um, that much it's more expensive to have a regional cluster if you anyway have three nodes and you get SLAs. With solo I don't think you can. So. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. Do you have uh, customers which have hybrid startups? Yes. Well um I guess we have some customers which just have services outside of Google Cloud, and there we just use a VPN connection. Um, 
to to just connect these services to the Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, <laughs> there's, yeah. A, there's a there's a but actually. Yeah. Um, we we don't have fun with those VPN connections. I think. Um, first yeah. first. Uh, <laughs> VPN is never fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> has never been fun. We're, we're yeah, but I guess. Yeah. I guess you want to run a, a direct name. I mean, I just have two of them to have a redundancy. So that you want to use direct connect before. I don't know what's the service name for that, but I guess yeah. you have them as well. Yeah, I guess I guess if you have a lot of traffic, um, VPN wouldn't do it, and it would be way too costly anyway. Um, yeah. So you would probably have a direct connect. I, I can't remember how it's called. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, we we haven't had the need yet. Yes, that's true. So far, VPNs are okay, but but um, yeah. Um, the the thing is, if you if you have yeah, if you don't have a direct connection, right, and you're still using VPN, then you actually, if you don't want to have a single point of failure, you you want to have the the like a BGP controlled VPN, uh, yeah. the AJ, the AJ mode of cloud VPN, so Google's Google solution. But then the other side also need to have at least two devices, right? Where BGP controls which one is active or which paths get routed to where, and um, that actually doesn't happen so often. That something like that is there, and if you another another thing is if you have something which produces a lot of traffic, like if you if you have a, a server which with uh, high response sizes um, is running somewhere, then the traffic costs are also not neglectable. I'd say, like always in the cloud, right? Traffic mm -hmm. is is cheap. <laughs> That's it. It's, yeah, it get, can get pretty expensive. That's why we always actually recommend if it's possible to bring the service to Google, just do it. Bring it as close to the cluster as possible, and then there will be not so, yeah, there won't be any, let's say, risk factors in between. We, we also experience problems with nothing. Sometimes if you have, if you have a different data center somewhere, then you are you are forced to to speak from a specific range, and that's an issue actually because our pod range in Kubernetes is quite big, uh, mm. because we don't know how many pods the customer will spawn. So the network for that is actually quite big, and it might overlap with the target site. And there we actually yeah there we actually have have problems where we need to put something in between which then does a nothing. Um, then again, you need to think about single points of failure. So in general, um, yeah, connecting remote locations if you don't have direct connect is not always painless. Mm. And I guess even with direct connect, you have the nothing issues. No, uh, yeah. actually, actually, no. You don't. Okay. No, because you you direct all the traffic via cloud out. So ah, uh, okay. So it goes through one. Exactly. You can uh, and you have a redundancy if, if one link fails that the other take over. So mm. this is okay. 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 Good to know, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Well, with, with VPNs, we're not so good, let's say. Uh, yes, yes. That's also right. Yes. Mm. A, free, a free gigabit, I mean, yes. You, you I guess if you're hitting, if you're hitting three, gig, three gigs per second, you should probably use direct connect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, just from the cost side. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another question, which we actually, which we didn't get asked, but how is cube control pronounced? <laughs> I, don't know if, 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 I don't know if you guys actually know that joke, but um, yeah, we found that the funniest, the funniest pronunciation we found actually was from the, was it from the Google videos? Which you yeah yes it it was from the the, the GCP um, certification <laughs> cobble <laughs> yeah yeah from the certification videos she called it cube cobble and or or no 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 that was that was the funniest one <laughs> the best one was cube uh, cubectal cubectal yes yeah so uh, that was actually a long joke actually in the department in the team. Cubectal, and it's also, I think we're still saying that. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Cubectal, yeah. But yeah, it might, it might be true. Uh, yeah, is Kubernetes secure? Well, 
I think I think Kubernetes it, on on its own does a lot for security already. I mean, if 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 you if you compare it with a normal managed server, with, which may might have like a public IP and whatever you deploy there might be available to the internet, right? Or reachable from the internet if you don't have a firewall and whatever. The Kubernetes mo uh, network mo model already is you explicitly need to need to like to open your services with services or ingress or whatever. So you actually need to do something that it's uh, reachable from the outside. Uh, so I, I like that. I think that does something for security. If you want to go deeper, I mean, there's GVisor and there is, uh, yeah, you always need to rest should restrict your user to not run it this route. And mm. yes, there's way more actually. Um, that the only thing, yeah, it makes it complex. I think it, it, it really makes it makes it complex and I'm at least not aware if there's uh, like an easy solution. I mean, OpenShift, um, OpenShift does a lot by default, like no root user, and, and, and I think also something with um, with UIDs for for, for storage, uh, SE Linux, and whatever. Um, but we started with OpenShift, and that also makes it actually hard to start some 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 Docker images from 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 Docker Hub, for example. Mm -hmm. and that's what most people do if they if they if they actually get Kubernetes discussed first. Um, they want to. They want to try something. They want to run the same stuff they could run with Docker on their on their laptop, right? They want to. They want to run them on Kubernetes, and that just doesn't work. And then you need to explain why it doesn't. Why it doesn't work? And uh, I don't know. I, I think there's not a real cool customer friendly solution yet. You can do a lot, that for sure, but I'm not sure if there will ever be a really customer friendly. Yeah. But I guess security has never been simple, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Just need to move a bit here because it's sad. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, unsecure images. That's that's uh, yeah. That's that's another topic, I guess. Um, just yeah. pulling some images from some source you've never heard of. Yeah, can be dangerous. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but but that's what what most people do also. Yeah, I mean, do, do do people really look into Docker files? How the image was built, basically? Do it? Do they build the image themselves? I mean, except it's their own software. Then exactly. Yeah. I I expect it, right? And um, and that's and that's fine. But then I don't know. What also people like to do is to try to put ancient software into containers and run it on Kubernetes. And some software was just not built for that. And then they need I don't know high ports or, or or whatever features which just yeah which just don't work. It's also something where I at least say if it's if, if it's just not built for 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 Kubernetes, don't try to squeeze it into. I don't know. I don't know. Do you have a different opinion on that? So no, no, it's <laughs> kind of agree. <laughs> but yeah, if you have no other choice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the last question I actually have prepared, except there are, uh, yeah. um, is is it is it hard to run an old Kubernetes cluster, like an on-premise one? Um, um, I mean, I can't say that I actually uh, did a whole like unmanaged one because we we ran uh, open shipment before at night, right? Um, yeah, but I think there's there's still a lot to do. If you, if you manage your own Kubernetes, like let's say a plain vanilla Kubernetes, where you need to take care of updates and, and where you also need to read for every version which which changes are coming, like deprecations or, or whatever, then it's quite of a task. I'd say. Mm. Well, I'd, I'd say the distributions uh, have evolved a bit. So running just plain, let's say Rancher, for example, that's yeah. pretty nice. You get some stuff with it but as soon as you want uh want something like persistent volumes that are magically appearing out of nowhere <laughs> yeah. stuff like that then it gets really complicated node pools auto scaling all that stuff is very yeah. very easy on the cloud that's at least what we uh, what yeah. we experience it makes it makes more fun actually it makes more fun to do stuff on, on Kubernetes in the cloud than it was uh, yeah when we had it on premise um, but yeah, opinions might differ there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, in general, it's possible to run an own Kubernetes, but I think it's 
not sure if I would do it. Like to offer it to customers. I'm not sure if I would still go with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think those have been the questions actually we have prepared. If there are no other questions coming up. Yeah, but there is a other option. So you can run TCOS or OpenShift managed service. I mean OpenShift service on prem itself. So if you if you have some visualization system like this theory is CI setup, uh, yeah, you can. Yep. Okay. And I, I think especially for OpenShift. I mean, um, OpenShift free with um, we were actually not really okay with all the Ansible stuff which render. I'm, I'm not saying anything against Ansible, but one update, for example, took for us <laughs> with our nodes, it took multiple hours. And then if it if it failed in between. You had to start from scratch, and that actually sucked. To be honest, <laughs> to be honest, I mean that uh, that was really not so cool. In OpenShift four, a lot changed there. I mean, they invested a lot with that, right? Um, I don't have any big experience with OpenShift four. Uh, I just read the features, and that was actually quite cool. Um, but still, still, you're actually yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know if I would still go that route. But they do a lot. They do also a lot for the community. I think. Although I'm still not sure if OpenShift 4 has now to get that open, open source variant published. There was a bit of an ongoing discussion if they would ever, right? But yeah, in general, there are options, that's, that's, that's true. Yeah, there are no other questions. I think we are done. It's red dead yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was also a cool thing, yeah, that they got acquired. Yeah, uh, interesting. <laughs> and also, I mean, we have that whole, I mean, Jakob's, Jakob's talk, he mentioned Strava. I think I got an email from Strava today that they changed their business model, that they will remove features from the from the free version. Oh, really? Huh. Yes, yes. It's uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so... There aren't any other questions. I would then uh, close the official part. So we stop the recording. So we don't have to to go away. If you want to have uh, chats between each other, feel free. But uh, last call for a question to be recorded, or I will stop now. Sorry. No one. Okay, so then uh, I stop the recording and uh, thank you very much, uh, Cyril and uh, Nick, for answering the question. Uh, it was, from my side, a good experience. Uh, and I will sure continue uh, with uh, having at least one part online. So if we can do events uh, in our uh, location in Zurich again, we'll do it. And But we'll uh, record it and, and live stream it somehow that we can have the possibility for uh, people all over the world to join, like uh, Chris did, uh, our employee in uh, Canada. <laughs> Good. Okay, then thank you very much and uh, bye.